Welcome everyone. I'm Alan Claypool, President of Tech 4 Solutions. We have a great crowd tonight to our sixth, I believe it is, Tackle with Tech 4, where we tackle the issues, not each other. So tonight is about respectful discourse, having very intelligent and yet still respectful conversation on um, controversial issues. In the past, we've done um, universal health coverage, campaign finance reform, immigration, coal, Gun control is, I would say, our hardest one. And tonight we are talking about GMO versus non-GMO, genetically modified organisms, in our food. So thank you all for coming. Uh, we will have audience participation tonight uh, at specific times, so I'll let you all know when that is. So at the beginning, let me talk through, this is what our um, political discourse tends to be, of everyone just yelling at each other. And what we want to do is instead of moving from yelling to try to get us to where we feel like we are on the same team as collaboration, actually talking to each other, where we hear each other's needs better so that we can come up with better solutions. Um, all of this started from my company, TAC4 Solutions, where we work with executive leadership teams to get them to behave better, to get CEOs to start listening to their employees better, to stop thinking that they have the answer to everything and all of their employees are so stupid and all of their customers are so stupid. When we can get them to be less egocentric, they actually start solving their problems, problems so much better. And we gave, uh, we have these ground rules that we use in business and we gave um, some, excuse me, some seminars on these ground rules and someone asked us, how do you apply these ground rules to politics? And I laughed and I said, I don't. Because in politics, I complain all the time and blame the other side for all horrible motives. And that's the opposite of our ground rules. And so that really challenged me. And I started changing my own perspective, my thinking. And we um, started these events about a year ago, a little over a year ago, where we tackled difficult issues, but according to a new set of ground rules. So um, the logistics for the evening are that we will have each panelist speak for seven minutes. Then we will sit one panelist down and deep dive with the other panelists, getting to know what their true needs are that they're trying to solve, what their fears are, meaning what they're trying to protect from the other side, and what their solutions are. How can they, from their perspective, solve a problem? That's what these whiteboards are off to the side, um, where we're going to track that and write down each panelist's needs, fears, and solutions. And then, we will talk to you for just a moment, not for long audience participation, but for what other concerns do you all have that may not be listed on the board that did not get mentioned, if there are any extra needs, fears, needs or fears that you may have that we want covered when the panelists then begin their long discussion. So they'll have a 45 minute free for all, we call it. And during this free for all, basically I'm not up here to ask them questions. We are up here only to monitor on the ground rules, to make sure that the panelists are understanding the ground rules and are living by them. And when we see that they maybe are outside of our ground rules a little bit, or um, maybe even when they're deeply inside the ground rules and doing a fantastic job, we will pause their discussion by throwing a little football flag, a little football flag. Um, not to, not to penalize anybody, but to make sure that we are understanding that this is either a fantastic use of one of our ground rules, what they've just talked about, or let's uh, have an area of improvement. Let's talk through what the mindset was um, when you said something that was outside of our ground rules and how can we get back in. So we'll probably pause the discussion maybe three to five times. I don't know how many times. It depends on how the panelists do and live by our ground rules. Um, so you all can expect that, that this is not just a typical debate, it's a debate where we're really trying to learn how to have discourse, respectful discourse with people who have drastically different beliefs and values than us. So um, then we will open it up, after the 45 minutes, we'll open it up for about 25 minutes of true audience participation. Everybody will have about three minutes or so, anybody that wants to talk, there's a microphone over here that we'll have you come to. So let's go over our ground rules. The first ground rule is show respect with no hint of blame. Most of our political conversation is that the other side is the cause of all my problems. That if they weren't doing this, this, and this, then my side would be getting what we need. And what we want to realize is that most all of us, all of us really, are trying to make the world a better place. That we um, do not 
that I am not causing your problems, that I just have a different set of needs that you're not aware of, and if we actually talked a little more, we would be able to get some better solutions. So show respect with no kind of blame is ground rule one, ground rule two, assume positive intent from all on the other side. And this, I think, is really difficult in the political realm. I gave a speech last week, and people were so convinced that those in power are evil, and that they... <laughs> And you are not alone. Yes, and and that perspective is really what's prevent from from TAC 4s perspective. That is what's preventing us from being able to talk to each other better. And so we want to, as we have these conversations, not just for John and Jennifer to believe that each other has good motives, but for all on the other side. That I believe that most all people on the other side are really trying to make the world a better place, but they are doing so in a way that is trampling on one of my needs. And so it's easy for me to believe that they are evil because they're trampling on one, of our, on one of my needs. So if we instead talk more reasonably, then we will um, be able to get better solutions. Um, so believe that we all are wanting to make the world a better place. Ground rule number three is understand and care about the other side's needs, fears, and proposed solutions. So we are doing something specifically to make sure this happens, which is let's analyze what your needs, fears, and solutions are, write them on the board, and then when we open up for open discussion between the panelists, I've already asked them, start that open discussion by mentioning one of the other side's needs and how you can go about solving those needs, or maybe how your current position is not meeting those needs. <clears throat> what I want us to think about, because this is reality, this is the truth, whether we think about it or not, we are actually trying to rock climb together. We are really belayed to each other, even those people on the opposite side. Of the, of the argument from us. And so we are either going to make it to the top or to the bottom, one way or another, together. So if I hear your needs and let you hear my needs and see how we can get new solutions that meet both of our needs, we'll make it to the top instead of falling down like we currently do. Ground rule four, do not complain without offering solutions with realistic action steps that meet both sides' needs. In business, um, our first ground rule is really all about this. No complaining until you're willing to take action. And it's really saying every complaint that I have, what can I do to fix that complaint? It's about personal accountability. It's about no longer just being frustrated and blaming someone else for it, but instead saying that frustration that I have, what can I do to make it better? And we ask our clients to visualize every complaint that they have, visualize that there is a flag, that you can write your complaint on that flag and hold that flag until you have figured out how to resolve it. Not until you've figured out how somebody else can resolve it, but how you can resolve it. And this is what we ask for our panelists. Every time that you have some frustration, some need, some complaint, bring a solution that you can participate in and not just that the other side has to do to solve. Ground rule number five, clarify, clarify opinion from fact. This was really tough because most of us believe that when I read one article telling me something, and maybe even it had a statistic in it, it must be true. What's really going on is it feels like it's true because that statistic lines up with my worldview. And it's okay to believe certain statistics because of your worldview, but what we ask of our panelists is to clarify that this is my opinion. This statistic that I'm bringing to the table is my opinion. I'm agreeing with the statistic because of a worldview. Most of I was a math major in college, and we read a book called How to Lie with Statistics. And the reality is that it, most statistics have bias in them. Most statistics depend on how the questions were asked or how the surveys were done. And so we just ask our panelists to recognize that these are opinions as much as, the, as more than they are facts, most of them. So just clarify that. Say the word, I believe, I think. This is, and explain the reason you got your, where you got the source from and why you believe it to be true. As opposed to, this is what mostly happens in our campaign. We're already hearing political ads and there's just, you know, questionable truths all throughout those ads. So let's, let's start clarifying our opinions for facts. Ground rule number six, seek the truth and workable solutions over political positioning. So most of us came into this room believing something probably about GMO, whether it was good or bad, whichever way you think it is. 
what we are asking you to do is not to try to win, but rather seek truth. Let's figure out what's really going to work and what's really going on, and don't bring your bias to it. Okay? Um, this really involves that we are egocentric, most of us. We are up on a pedestal feeling like we have absolute truth on our side, and the reality is we have a piece of the truth, and the other side does as well in almost every single argument that we have. So I ask you to come down from your pedestal, not to get off the pedestal altogether because you do have a piece of the truth, but just to realize that other people do as well. So come on a lower pedestal and recognize that other people also have valid opinions. Ground rule number seven, where there are core philosophical differences, and there are, we do have valid differences when you get down to our core. Just clarify those differences without accusation, and it's so seldom that we really get down to the root cause of our issues, of what we're up to, that we don't get down to that core philosophy of what drives us from why we believe what we believe. So just ask a lot more questions. That's what we're asking the panels to do. Say, why? Why? Tell me why you believe that. Because it does recognize that we have divergent roads that we're going to go down, largely because we do have different views. So... Let's try to get to our core. So these are our seven ground rules. These will stay up through the entire um, event tonight at the back of the room so that we have them. So let me introduce our coaches for the evening. We have Deanna Philpott, president of People Strategy Consulting, which is a catalyst for igniting the passion and performance of leaders and people for organizational excellence and success. We also have Joe Luttrell, president of EQ Seminars, who's an inspirational speaker, and he's also the author of Emotional Account the upcoming book, Emotional Accountability, How Washington, Lincoln, and Churchill Transform Anxiety into Emotional Intelligence. Fascinating book. And finally, Lynn Schusler Williams, founder of Go Beyond Consulting, uh, which specializes in accelerating sales results, driving through change, creating a life you love living, and networking for success. So these coaches will be helping me to dive into the whys behind all of um, the arguments that you'll hear tonight. You'll meet them in just a second. So tonight we'll be talking about GMO versus non-GMO, and our esteemed panelists are Jennifer Elwell, Director of Communications for Kentucky Corn Growers Association. She's also part of the National Common Ground Program, the columnist for the Farmer's Pride, and she blogs at foodmommy.net. And she's a contributor, contributor to Michelle Payne Knopper, Knopper's no more food fights. Sorry, I think I said your name wrong, <laughs> Michelle. And then finally, we have John Moody, who's a board member of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, administrator of the Whole Life Buying Club, and Farm Food Freedom Coalition, and he's the author of Food Club in the Co-op Handbook. So these are our ground rules. I'd like for you all to welcome our panelists and our coaches. Planting GMT, he insists, is critical if we are to avert it. 
offering farmers increased yields, huge reductions in the use of chemical pesticides, and crops modified in ways which will directly improve human health. So those, those are kind of the three pillars of why we need GMOs. We need greater yields because we're running out of land and we have more and more mouths to feed. We need to reduce these dangerous chemicals that we're using to grow food. And we need to increase the nutritional value of food. And I personally think that Professor Maloney is making a little bit of baloney with those claims. First, GMO yields are overstated. A 13-year side-by-side study done by Iowa State University, a 30-year side-by-side study done by Rodale, a comparison of European and Russian row crop yields to American yields, and the University of Canterbury Research Center have all found that conventional and organic crop yields are similar or superior to GMO crop yields. They're more profitable for farmers, and they also build soil health for the long term. Even the USDA has admitted that there are many factors involved in the increases in agricultural gains outside of or in no way related to GMO crops. GMOs are really a pseudo-solution looking for a problem in my opinion. We already produce twice as many calories as are needed to feed the world. And while we're running out of space to row crop, we are nowhere close to even beginning to use all of the productive land and resources for food production. You could easily double the amount of food grown in the world without tilling any more land, just by better utilizing land we already have access to. The root cause of hunger in the third world really isn't agricultural, it's economic. These people cannot afford the food anymore because it's been commoditized. It's out of their economic reach. Again, it's not an issue that we need to grow more. We need to make food more affordable for them. So GMO chemicals are creating a bitter harvest. Nearly half of all U.S. farmers surveyed say they now have glyphosate-resistant weeds. For those of you who don't know what glyphosate is, it's the chemical name for Roundup, which is the chemical that most GMO farmers use to remove weeds from their fields. And this is becoming a massive problem across the United States. 92% of farmers in Georgia say they now have glyphosate resistant weeds. So glyphosate, for a time, reduced the need for chemical pesticides, and now it's becoming ineffective. Millions and millions of acres are infected with one or more type of weed that is resistant to this pesticide. So farmers are moving back to more dangerous and harsher chemicals like 2D, 2,4-D, I should say. Um, Sagenta, one of the world's largest pesticide makers, is reporting record sales of its insecticides. And its own chief financial officer attributes the growth to increased grower awareness of rootworm resistance. Well, what's the rootworm became resistant to? It became resistant to Monsanto's BT corn. It was a corn that had the BT toxin engineered right into it to protect the corn from this rootworm. And already that trade is failing, and the company that makes this pesticide is reporting record profits as farmers have to abandon the GMO traits and go back to the chemicals. And I just want to point out, notice the similarities to antibiotic usage. Whenever we mess with nature in this way, it always comes back to haunt us. Whether it's broad spectrum use of antibiotics that are now responsible for an epidemic of antibiotic resistant bacteria in hospitals, or in terms of chemically treating soil as a way to get away from weeds and things, and now we're developing bugs and weeds that are resistant to the very chemicals that we're using. As I like to put it, nature can't be fooled. Or for those of you who are Christians, you cannot outrun the fall. So GMO promises have failed the flower. Farmer after farmer reports increased spraying in their areas, increased chemical contamination, lowering yields. Um, the, the GMO companies, though, on the other hand, are doing really well in this scenario. While the farmers are getting squeezed by now being stuck on GMO seeds and having to buy the pesticides they were told they wouldn't need anymore, 
The price of the genetically modified seeds is increasing drastically, squeezing the farmer's profits, while Monsanto and the other companies seem to be doing quite well. So GMOs are bad for farmers, not just in America, but around the world. In India, things have gotten so bad that the Indian Supreme Court has put a moratorium on all field trials of GMO crops. Because the farmers in India are committing suicide in record numbers. And the Indian agricultural authorities have tied it to the cultivation of GMO crops. So this is a quote from you know, their ICAR, the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, and their Cotton Bureau. So the Indian authorities see the GMO crops as directly harming the livelihood of the farmers in their nation. GMOs are probably or potentially harmful to human health. Former GMO scientist, Dr. Thierry Vrain from Canada, he worked in the major biotech in Canada for a number of years before becoming an outspoken GMO critic, warns about the danger of gene transfer, about genetic contamination now even showing up in rivers and soil. Nature, um, Nature Journal, a major publication, just ran an article a few weeks ago on how GMO genes are showing up in wild plants in altering the surrounding ecosystem with no way to know how that would affect it. And so hopefully we'll have an excellent time tonight exploring all these issues and more. Again, my name is Jennifer L.L. Good evening. I'm just going to do this. <laughs> I want to thank Alan Claypool and Tack Warren and all the other moderators for allowing me to have the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I know that my viewpoint on GMO food is not publicly the most popular view, so I appreciate those of you in the audience that are willing to listen to my side as well. And I'll be honest, um, there's a lot of things in John's PowerPoint that I've seen before, a lot of things that I do agree with, and you know, some things that are facts. So um, I hope we can discuss those as, as the night goes on. One of the things that Alan asked us not to do um, was to tell a lot of emotional stories in our opening monologue, so I think I'll start there. The fact is, food is an emotional subject, and we all develop our preferences based on our stories. I did not grow up on a large grain farm, and up until taking my position with the Kentucky Corn Growers 15 years ago, I did not know a whole lot about production agriculture. I did come from what many of us consider the quintessential family farm. My father's family raised corn, tobacco, hay, they milked dairy cows, and raised a number of other animals in Spencer County. Uh, my dad left the farm, and while my parents both had full-time jobs, Outside the home when I was young, we continued to raise chickens, rabbits, we milked dairy goats, um, hay. And we did this to kind of ease our grocery bill. To this day, 90% of the meat in my freezer is venison that my husband or family has hunted and prepared. I know how to kill and clean a chicken. I can milk a goat by hand. So if there's a picture of what an opponent of Big Ag looks like, it's probably a picture of me. You'd think it'd be a picture of me. However, because of the career path presented to me, I have talked with many farmers over the years. I continue to talk to them. I follow research. I learn as much as I can about the technologies farmers are using um, so I can do my job. As a wife and mother of two children under the age of 10, I am not in any way concerned about genetically modified foods when it comes to my family's health, the health of our environment, or worry that it may negatively alter food production in the future. Regarding the safety of our food, we have been manipulating genetics since the dawn of agriculture. I recently learned that the wild corn plant that grew in North America had holes on each of its kernels. The Native Americans selected to breed this trait out of the corn plant even thousands of years ago. Now, I understand that selective breeding is a much different process than adding a gene from a different plant, but genetic modification is a more precise proce process, takes much less time, so the benefits can be reaped much sooner. 
The new genetic material occurs in nature, and numerous tests have been conducted to ensure their safety. In most cases, these crops have been tested 6 to 12 years. While many have come forward with theories and studies that say the GMOs may not be safe, the fact that more than 3 million meals with GMO ingredients have been consumed without any zero allergic reactions or ill effects is enough proof for me regarding their safety. Effects on the environment are another issue at hand, and actually the biggest selling point for GMOs for me. The use of genetically modified crops such as corn, cotton, and soybeans is significantly reducing the amount of insecticides and more harmful herbicides used by farmers, as well as reducing significant amounts of fuel needed to produce these crops. BT corn is a genetically modified plant that resists corn borers, a serious corn pest. The corn contains a gene from the bacterial endotoxin, which is actually an approved natural organic pesticide. In the case of Roundup Ready crops, many argue that the trait allows farmers to spray more of the herbicide. And resistance is another issue. While the use of glyphosate has increased with this variety, use of other more dangerous herbicides have decreased. It also allows farmers to more precisely manage their weed control programs and use a no-till system that has reduced soil erosion and fuel as well as improved soil structure. Reduced energy, reduced chemical control, and improved soil health equals sustainability in my mind. So who owns the technology? One of the trickiest parts of the biotechnology equation comes down to ownership. I have heard many say that Monsanto is controlling our farmers and food and forcing them to use their products. Nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, a farmer has choices in what he or she plants on their land. Many choose certain conventional hybrids or genetically modified hybrids because they offer an advantage over others, depending on their soil and environment. In the case of GM varieties, they are chosen because the farmer actually saves money on costly inputs. Second, if a farmer purchases seed with a certain technology, they must sign a technology stewardship agreement. This is very similar to the technology agreement you abide by when purchasing computer software. Companies that develop these seeds, and yes, there are others besides Monsanto, have devoted a lot of money and resources to produce the technology. The agreement states that farmers may not save the seed to replant or sell the seed. They must also agree to follow an insect-resistant management program. There are other provisions, but all seem perfectly within reason. I can provide a link to the agreement if anyone is interested after the event. Third, farmers are not forced to use Roundup or Roundup-ready crops. It is just suggested. And last, despite myths propagated by some media, farmers are not sued because pollen from a nearby genetically modified crop drifts into and pollinates another crop. While pollination drift can occur, farmers have been conscientious of keeping different crop varieties segregated for many, many years. I know several farmers who grow conventional, GM, and specialty corn crops each year. Allowing them to cross-pollinate would not be beneficial. So where does the future lie with biotechnology in our food supply? I personally believe that we are on the right track to use all production methods available to us to provide more food for the growing population in a sustainable way. As a consumer, I like knowing that I have options available to me regarding the technology used. I also like knowing that the agricultural community, whether traditional, conventional, organic, or genetically modified, is working to see that food production has less impact on the environment. I blog periodically at foodmommy.net to share my views about food production, parenting, and health issues. And as my daughter, who is here tonight, can attest, I am pretty strict about what my family eats on a regular basis. My last post talked about how I was thankful for Frankenfood, not because of all the benefits I have listed this evening, but for the fact that it has people thinking about our food supply, and I think that is very important. So now, let's roll up our sleeves, stop pointing fingers, and figure out how we can all work together to feed the world. Thank you.
Well, I think the first need is the ability of people to choose what they eat. Um, so one of the major issues with genetically modified foods is it takes away the choice of what I feed my family. Or as a farmer who doesn't want to grow genetically modified crops, the risk of genetic contamination is significant. So it, it takes away my choice because of what, cross-pollination? Yeah, there's an issue of cross-pollination. Um, which is so significant that I know in Washington right now, there's actually been protests over certain genetically modified crops being introduced into the Beaumont Valley because organic sugar beet growers or other organic growers in this confined area have no way to keep genetically modified pollen from cross-contaminating their plants. And sorry, I am, and I'll tell the audience that I am by no means an expert on GMO or food of any kind, really. I've mostly done my research in the last week. Um, but So any question I ask might be a bit of an ignorance, but it seems like that would have been the case even before GMO came about, that cross-pollination might limit my ability to choose if the farmer next to me is planting something that could pollinate mine. Is that not true? But there's nothing in that farmer's crop at that time that wasn't already existing in that crop's genome. So, it, it's, um, so think of it this way. Is it true farmers throughout world history have been hybridizing crops? Yes. Would a farmer ever through hybridization been able to get a BT toxin into their corn? No. So, so to argue that hybridization and genetic engineering are similar overlooks the fact that a farmer is never going to mate a frog with corn and get anything that produces offspring. They're introducing things into this crop's genome that never genetically existed there. They're, they're crossing species with genetic information that never existed in that species before and through no natural means could ever have been introduced. Whereas cross-pollination previously... I think we're going to jump over to our question. Well, I, I think, you know, people who are against GMOs would say, um, we have no problem with hybridization. We have no problem with plant breeding to increase yields, to bring about desirable traits, etc. cetera. Um, but we would say there is a need to differentiate genetic, these technologies and what they're doing from what farmers have done from thousands of years, because they're not at all equal. So I was just going to uh, ask, it, it sounds like you're directly confronting with no triangulation on two fronts. One is this hybridization. Sounds like you're just trying to bring together nice species of corn the way we've done for thousands of years, but you're, you're directly confronting that saying, you know, uh, genes from bacteria and, and uh, uh, insects and things like that are, are put in. So it's, it's a little, and people, and, and you need people to understand that, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, let's see, I think I lost the other one, so I'll come back to that. <laughs> so, so tell me more needs. What other needs are you trying to meet? Um, I think another one would be a level playing field for agriculture. GMO crops are heavily subsidized in America. Um, so I would submit that given the government regulational structure, one of the reasons these crops are so prevalent versus other crops is because they've been incentivized by government regulation and subsidies in a way that our agricultural system would have never developed this way and in a way that I think hurts small farmers. So, so that actually kind of plays off that uh, come back. Um, to, uh, it, it sounded like that Jennifer said that farmers aren't being sued for cross-pollination and are you directly uh, challenging that as well? I would submit there's evidence to show that farmers who have had fields contaminated with GMO pollen were then sued by Monsanto and other companies for they never planted GMO seeds. Their conventional crops were contaminated and then they were sued. So that will be something that we address during the open discussion because it sounds like there's a difference. <laughs> Nobody's blaming each other, we just have a difference of possibly the facts that we John, it would help me um, if, when we go to ground rule number five, by clarifying opinion from fact, 
it would help me if uh, you could say, in my opinion, uh, uh, because I'm, I get a little confused not being kind of an expert about what's fact and what's opinion. GMO is being GMO GMO farm is being subsidized. Is that correct, John? Well, the the government subsidizes particular crops, but especially if you look at the USDA subsidy database and who those subsidies go to, it it disproportionately tilts towards corn and soy, and a few other GMO crops. Okay. Minutes, okay. Are there other um, needs that you're trying? I would assume something about health, or you know, maybe that's the fear. Um, well, this would be another point um, where I would think that we don't disagree. There's a recent L article. Um, L is a pretty well-known magazine where a, a lady basically tracked her food allergy back to exposure to GMO corn. And there are thousands and thousands of people, like my wife, who when exposed to particular foods, has allergic reactions. And some people seem to have traced that to GMO crops in particular. Um, so that would just be another difference of opinion. Um, in the sense of, I think there are true safety concerns. And so that would be, I would think, a fear that you're trying to protect against is new allergens or something like that. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Other fears? And by fears, I'm mostly asking, what are you trying to protect against? If the other side got their way, what would you lose? What, what could potentially hurt you? Well, if, if GMO crops continue to expand to more and more species, we lose organic agriculture. So now with, with conventional agriculture, conventional and organic agriculture can exist side by side. But GMO agriculture and organic agriculture cannot because of genetic drift. So for instance, Dr. Thierry Vrain, who I mentioned, has pointed out, Canada has lost their flax and canola exports because the genetic contamination is now so widespread throughout the nation. And so they are no longer able to export canola and flax to many other nations that won't accept GMOs. And, and so are just under, trying to understand, is it true then, from opinion or fact or whichever, that those crops, that flax does not exist in organic nature anymore in Canada? Is that what you're saying? Why would they have lost their export? Well, because certain countries ban GMO exports of certain crops. There's some countries that... So it's not that the flax doesn't, isn't there, that organic flax can't be grown. It can be grown. You said side by side they can't exist together. Yeah, well, you know, again, like, you can't grow an organic flax field right next to a GMO flax field. Because now the organic flax field will cross breed. Because it will have um, genetic drift. So as a, there's an organization called the GMO Project, I believe, GMO Verified, um, that's, that does GMO testing. And over time, more and more organic crops are showing GMO contamination. It's low, a half a percent, one percent, two percent, but every year the contamination increases because farmers can't control wind and bees and tornadoes and derachos and everything else. Um, and so there's no way to protect an organic farmer from a GMO farmer's pollen. Even with long distances of withdrawal, all you need is a set of tornadoes to rip through, okay. and you've now spread GMO pollen over literally hundreds of square miles. Okay, so I think a fear would be genetic drift. Is that accurate? And I would assume there's some concern about the health effect of GMO. Like, hey, if GMO is fantastic, then what do we care? Yeah, and, and, you know, this is where the science becomes a very naughty and difficult issue. Are GMOs actually detrimental to human health? Um, how do we actually do incredibly complex science on people? 
what about the ways that these companies actually protect the seeds from actually having long-term scientific studies done on them under various complex agreements? Um, so I personally have health concerns about GMOs. It doesn't bother me if another person wants to feed them to their family, but I should have the ability to choose not to eat them. So there is concern, though, about the health. I mean, yes. for instance, I'm just now coming up with this analogy, so it might be a terrible one, but hey, I love eight track recorders, and they're fantastic, so I should be able to buy one. Well, okay, that actually could, but if it doesn't harm me to get a CD player, and, we, and the whole market goes that way, let's get a CD player. There's no harm in it for the new technology. If there's no harm in it, so the market goes there. But I'm, I'm guessing that you would say, but there is harm, or at least I fear that there might be true harm. I think there are some studies that point to harm, and there is significant concern based on the faulty understanding of genetics that underlies GMO technology, that there is the possibility of significant future harm. Okay. Okay. Which certainly goes back to your wanting the ability to choose food in case there is harm, so I, I understand that. So we only have three or four minutes left for solutions. So what would you propose? the direction of our farms go. Now that we have GMO out there, what is your solution? Well, you know, based on my understanding of the facts, farmers lose nothing going back to conventional seed varieties. University of St. Louis just rolled out two new varieties of soybean that are non-GMO for this very reason. So one possible solution isn't sending farmers back to the dark ages, but reducing the amount of GMOs that are being planted. And, and push that still to be farmers' choice as to what they plant? Um, I mean, personally, I'm for banning GMOs as a private property rights issue. Um, but that's something I'm sure we'll get into as the night goes on. Um, and, and so, um, so, so like, again, because organic agriculture... Which, 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 by the way, would take away personal choice from those who like GMO, yes? True. I mean, again, like, but your rights always end where my rights begin, okay. um, and so... And because of genetic drift, then... Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so is that your solution, to ban GMOs? I think that's one possible solution. It's one that Hungary, the District of uh, British Columbia, Canada, Peru, and a number of other nations have taken. Um, one possible solution is to ban genetically modified foods until their safety is clearly established okay. and until their benefits are clearly established. Um, there's also mitigation... Which I would think that some on the GMO side would say it has been established. Oh, exactly. Safety has certainly been established. Yeah. Okay. Two minutes. Okay, so there's also the possibility of at least designating portions of the United States as only for organic agriculture and buffering those areas significantly from GMO agriculture and then giving time to see which systems actually do do better, which systems yield more calories per acre, which systems hold up under extreme weather situations better, etc. So not an outright ban, but establishing regions of the country where organic agriculture can flourish and have an opportunity to, on a level playing field, compete. So we can see which system does do best. Okay. Tina, Joe, final questions? Yeah, what, is the solu what solution do you propose to a reasonable person that's trying to sort all of this out? Because on one hand, you've got all these studies that sound like it's the greatest thing in the world, and on the other hand, you have a large group of people who are saying, be very afraid. Um, so, how do we sort that? Oh, we need another debate. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of the most difficult questions of the modern world. Um, if you remember the original Batman movie, you know, hubba hubba hubba, who do you trust? Um, it's, it's a very complex issue why different individuals trust particular scientific sources and others do not, and which scientific sources are trustworthy and why. And as Alan said at the beginning, some of it goes back to presuppositions and are, other Are matters. you aware of any good articles on that that mm -hmm. a, normal, a human being of normal intelligence could read and understand? 
um, on that particular issue, I'll have to think about it in, in terms of how you, you know, there's a, there's a recent article published um, by a scientist who points out that within three years of publication, close to 90% of published studies are shown to be wrong or inaccurate. So even scientists themselves are admitting that especially American science is fundamentally flawed. Okay. Thank you, John. I just want to compliment John because you did come up with more than one solution. Um, so if we go to ground rule number four, it's just without offering solutions. I think that's real important and that also uh, gives some latitude for the other side to, to respond to that. Look at our coaches pointing out the ground rule. Violations and successes. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to give a huge thank you to Rudy because you all will be here till clearly midnight because we love to talk, or not for Rudy. So thank you for being so direct. I love it. Okay, Jennifer, you're up. Uh, here you go. Either way. Uh, okay. Um, so let's start by talking through what your needs are. What are you trying to accomplish with the year off? Well, I think it's one of the things I think is very interesting as more of a consumer and a mom my needs are, is number one, the same as John, the ability to choose what food I can purchase. So I agree with him totally on, on that point. Um, number two is I agree that that's a need for my farmers, the ability to, for them to be able to choose what they can and can't grow. And when we talk about needs, we actually find that the first two needs are the same. I love that. So we have drastically different opinions and solutions, and yet, deep common ground once we're talking about needs. So, yes. sorry, keep going. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that just popped out, you know, first thing. Uh, I want to be able to, to, I do choose very carefully, you know, what my children eat. I, you know, I watch nutrition information. Um, you know, obviously the genetically modified does not, does not affect my decision there, but, you know, there are many things that I consider. Um, and are we ready to go into uh, fears and solutions? Um. I, I, there's probably more needs. Like, for instance, on the GO, GMO argument, I would, I would think production is one of the needs, feeding the world, that sort of thing. Right, I do. And as, we, the population is growing. One of the things that um, I saw in John's slide that I do agree with is, you know, we are kind of maximizing the land we have, but, you know, could we do more? Yes. Yeah, the problem is... Um, people are not getting the food that they need. I did some research about India and found that they are the second most productive nation, nation in the world, yet about half of the food doesn't get to people. It is wasted. And, you know, that's, that's a real problem. So I see, you know, there are, there are a lot of things. Productive nation, you mean that they produce that much more food than second, most other nations? They are second to the United States in food production. In food production. Yes, they are the most populous nation as far as, you know, people for, for square mile, and the food is not getting to their people. Okay. So there, there are many issues out there regarding, you know, feeding, feeding a growing population, not just, you know, can we produce more food per acre. I do agree with John there. So, um, so with, with GMO, what need is GMO trying to solve? Um, one of the things that was brought out was about, uh, you know, increasing the yield. Um, that is not the real reason um, for genetically modified crops. It's actually so they can reduce inputs um, that are needed to go on those crops. Such as Roundup? Such as Roundup. Um, well, that's kind of a different issue, but like okay. the, BT, the BT corn, okay. you know, preventing, um, you know, that pest on the corn. They're not having to spray the you know, the insecticide on the corn. So that's saving, you know, the pesticide, that's saving fuel. Um, so, you know, it's reduced pesticide use is a need for our farmers. Just reduced input costs okay. in general because of land prices and, you know, there are many, many things that go into producing a crop. Um, and those costs go up for farmers year after year. And those inputs, Again, this is my cluelessness talking. Those inputs are sometimes seen as being harmful. Like, ooh, I've got pesticides on my fruit. I want to have less pesticides. 
Yeah. Um, we have GMO to reduce pesticide. I'm, 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 I'm making an argument that yes. I don't know. If that's yes, that is, that is one of the benefits of uh, the genetically modified for insect resistance. So they would have to um, spray less pesticides. Um, as far as the Roundup Ready, um, glyphosate is a much safer herbicide than some of the other ones, like 2,4-D. So they're managing their weeds a little better. Um, you know, he talked about weed resistance. Um, I sit in on all of the um, researchers' proposals to our to our boards and listen to what they are proposing, what they need to research next. You know, what's the next thing that needs to come down the pipe? Palmer amaranth is a horrible weed in the South. Um, you know, very few things kill it, but they found through research that one of the things that suppresses it is not through chemicals, but actually being able to get two crops, a double crop system in your field, which you start with wheat and then you follow it with soybeans because the growth of that wheat is suppressing the growth of the, of the weed. So, you know, farmers, it's not all about, you know, what chemicals can I use to produce my crop better? We are trying to find ways to, you know, more sustainably produce these crops. So, so would it need there be recognizing that there are other things going on too? Yes, yes. It is this is um, producing food is not all about genetic modification. We are um, researching many ways to try to be more sustainable these days. And, and also then on the one above, reduced pesticide use inputs. What I heard, tell me if this is correct, what I heard is that it's because of costs and because of health. Is that yes. correct? Yes, both okay. of those are, so are very important that, reasons. That, yeah, a separation there would be useful, of both costs. So John, on that, um, one of the things that I think have as a need is uh, for people to trust that genetically modified food isn't bad. And so the question that I have as part of that is reduced pesticide use translate into reduced pesticide ingestion if the uh, plant in itself is engineered to produce its own pesticide. Um, so, so from the standpoint of, you know, getting the, the need that you have, the fear that people are going to look at this as bad, is that an area that would need to be explained a little, a little further? Yeah, just, um, you know, more general awareness of how these um, you know, plant modifications work. More, we, we need to, the you know, farming community needs to do a better job, you know, of educating and sharing how things work, but, you know, I know everybody, you know, thinks that there is an agenda on both sides, so I know that's kind of difficult sometimes. And that is certainly one of the things that this forum is trying to, uh, on both sides, to, to get both people, both sides, to assume positive intent from on the other side. Is there an agenda? Well, sure, there is probably an agenda that has been built up from a positive intent, an initial positive intent on both sides. So, so let's try to assume that as we have this conversation. It's good. Well, I know um, in talking, you know, I've talked to several farmers in the last, you know, few weeks trying to prepare for that, and I really want to get to the heart of the matter. You know, one, are you forced to grow genetically modified crops? And they absolutely say no, they're not forced to do it. But they almost, they get tears in their eyes when you talk about, you know, their livelihood and the fact that they want to be able to produce more food on the land that they have. It is, it's part of their way of life. And, you know, whether you're an organic farmer or, you know, a conventional farmer with, you know, 20,000 acres, you know, they kind of look at that as, as a task from God to, you know, produce food for us. And, you know, it's very emotional to them. You know, I've, you know, I see, you know, and one of the farmers specifically, uh, you know, what would you say the biggest benefit was? And he's like, well, no doubt, you know, I think it's the sustainability factor, which, you know, many of us have different ideas of what that word means. But he's like, um, you know, less chemicals are coming out of my farm. My workers don't have to touch the chemicals as much. Um, you know, less chemicals are being, you know, transported around the country because I don't need them. Of these genetic so I just heard made. another need, safety of the farmer. Yes. Less chemicals being touched by the farmer. Okay, we haven't gotten into fears. So what are you, if the other side got everything they wanted, what would you lose? What fears do you have about that? I think the fear would be if there um, was a 
you know, kind of this cold turkey, we're not going to have genetically modified crops anymore. Because I think, you know, there would be a lot to lose immediately. Such as? Um, such as, you know, the um, needing all those inputs to produce the crop. Um, you know, that's, that's probably the biggest one. Uh, you know, we have come a long way, and again, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this is a yield cure-all, um, the genetic modification. Actually, the hybridization has done more, you know, in the last, you know, 50, 60 years than genetic modification has done. Um, so that's really, you know, been the real yield driver um, in this last half century. Um, but I think it's an option that farmers need right now until they can find something that's better. Uh, one of our researchers is looking at, you may not help explain this, reducing the frangipan in the soil. Now that is a hard layer in the soil that's produced naturally and it pretty much doesn't allow the um, plants to take up as much water as they could. He is looking at ways to reduce that, that, um, that hard layer in the soil and it is not by chemical means, it is by natural means. So, you know, and I've also got to sit in on some, a symposium um, with Alltech. Now they are a big proponent of using non-chemical means. They're, you know, they're kind of anti-antibiotic, you know, trying to find some good solutions to our um, modern agriculture. And, you know, it's very interesting the things that, you know, we got to sit in a forum about and talk about, you know, how, how can we, um, you know, address all of our food production uh, needs in the future without, you know, kind of leaning on, you know, what we're doing right now. Just Five. forward thinking. Five. This is Brian Kinsley-Block. I'll be around here up here with the Intervention Dramatic Field. Uh, we're not going to be able to I think it would be more, um, well. I think I heard you say that there would be a rise, a return in the rise of inputs. Right. Of the pesticides and such, as opposed to yields. They would want to make that up by, you know, having to return to old methods. And specifically, higher inputs. Right. Okay. Okay. And so, solutions? Or wait, are there other fears? Other, fears. other protections? Other things that if the other side ban GMO, let's say, what would you lose? Or that these solutions trigger a fear? Good. Good. Um, actually, I, I kind of, you know, agree with some of the things he said in the solutions, too. Um, Except for banning GMOs. Well, right. No, not, <laughs> not banning GMOs. But uh, I do. <laughs> and so we're done. <laughs> yeah, we do that. <laughs> uh, but when it, when it comes to, it's funny that I have, we have some farmers that are growing both genetic, or both organic and conventional crops. So um, if the market exists, for organic, and that farmer is going to see, you know, a premium for growing those crops. The farmer is going to do that, and we've had several um, inquiries about trying to find farmers that grow um, organic crops. So, you know, if if the markets were available, the farmers would provide those those crops. I would um, certainly want once we have open discussion for you all to talk through right. the side by side and see. Um, but as far as, you know, you're talking about the pollination drift and everything, I think that comes down to, you know, being a, a good neighbor, um, you know, um, I think it would be great if, you know, most grain farmers are established, you know, or at least the land has been established in, you know, growing certain crops, whether they're GMO or not. If someone moves in and says, you know, I wanna, I'm going to start an organic farming operation, you know, I think it would be a great idea for them to come together and let each other know so maybe they could, you know, segregate those kinds of crops. So there's, you know, some difference now. Tornadoes not going to stop, you know, pollination from moving, you know, hundreds of miles possibly. But I think there is a lot that we can do to just, you know, open the conversation between neighbors and what's going on in the community. So, you know, maybe some of those... That sounds like a solution. Out. Open the conversation between neighbors of GMO versus not GMO. Two. Okay. Other solutions? Um, I know uh, one of the things, ability to choose food with the labeling. Now this is probably, I know this is against, you know, kind of the industry standard, but I personally am okay with um, GMO labeling. I think, you know, it's kind of a step in the right direction. I would, you know, if, if I saw that, that it could contain GMOs, I would not, you know, just set it 
back on the shelf. I think that is a fear. If we could kind of go back to the fear that um, you know people would you know run and scream and say I don't want anything to do with that. But um, <laughs> so you're saying again, I'm sorry, the fear around labeling. It, the fear around labeling is that it would cause more fear if someone saw that you know on a package may contain genetic modification that they would you know believe that's one more thing that they needed to fear and question you know question the safety of the food supply. For instance, yesterday I watched a video where um, a chef was saying you don't want to put calories on the menu because it's the thing that will kill that item from ever being bought. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, you don't put calories on the menu. People won't buy it if it's high calories. So sort of a similar thing if it's labeled GMO and they have it in the main feeder. Right. Okay. Okay. Other solutions? Um, well, I think, you know, the solution, with the solu that my solution would be, you know, that we, I am, I think the industry should be open to you know, labeling of foods that could contain genetically modified ingredients. You know, we have to be proactive. Um, kind of like the peanuts, you go to every Dairy Queen, there's a, you know, sticker right there. This, you know, this shop has peanuts in it. So if you're allergic to peanuts, you need to drive them there. Um, so, you know, if people want to avoid that, there are ways. And they're already using labeling, and, you know, the certified non-GMO labeling is out there right now. And, you know, that's, that's a step in that direction for people to be able to choose the food that they want. And, and am I correct that, the, that um, there is a sort of a implied solution to continue GMO, continue GMO research, and go down that path as well as all other paths? Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. So that's continue right. and expand technology, science. Look at all look possible at all options. options. Okay, well, that was fantastic for both of so you all can. Uh, okay, for the next section, we want you all to come up. I think the microphone is off, um, so someone will need, the first person will need to switch it on if you have. Well, what we're, let, let me say why we do this little segment here. When we first started doing this Meets and Fears, um, we dug into the needs and fears of both panelists. And the audience mostly felt like the two panelists, I don't think this is the case tonight, but the, the audience felt like both panelists were a little too close together. And that half of their needs weren't represented up on the board. And once we got into the open discussion, the audience was like revolting because it was like, wait a minute, y'all aren't talking about what I need. So if there are other needs that you have in the whole conversation about food, we would want you to come up. This is not time for a long audience participation, but specifically if you have needs that you don't see represented on, on the board, or if you have fears that are not represented on the board, then please come up and let us know. And if you don't, that's okay, but if anybody has any, yes, wonderful. Just make your way, yes, just make your way up. Um, first person will need to turn the mic on. And again, this is not for five minute elaboration we're just oh, looking for no it's okay no please <laughs> we're just looking for like maybe 30 second needs or fears and then a little bit later on you'll have lengthy audience participation oh it's on okay actually i have a solution okay um one solution for the um, non-gmo side would be to remove all the subsidies and then okay. see what what pro uh, crops the farmers want to grow okay Good. Um, a solution for the a solution I would like to see for the pro GMO side would be I'd like to see the studies that have been done on on consumption, what it does to the human body. I'd like to see not just the results, but how many people were studied, how long the study went, things De like that. Details of studies. Details of the studies. Education. Wonderful. Education. Excellent. Thank you. That was fantastic. That's exactly the type of thing we're looking for. So, anybody else, feel free to come up to them. Um, uh, a fear that I have is, um, uh, this comes to the issue of trust of, you know, who your proxy is for reality, I guess. And <clears throat> I see so much involvement with uh, companies who have a stake that are working on some of the studies and I guess maybe I would share that sentiment about wishing that there were completely third-party studies that we could have easy access to. Um, so, so I'm hearing a fear yeah. being um, that the that the science collusion. Is, is contaminated. Corporate collusion with science. 
potential. Is that and with the with the Food and Drug Administration, with government, or um, government, especially because science. government has put money. You know, I mean, they have now a vested interest. So, so it, it, to Sally's point, if you follow the money, um, the other fear that I have is that <clears throat> some of the illnesses that could um, come from genetically modified food may not be so obvious under shorter terms. Like, there, it is a, here again, who's our proxy, but I know that Crohn's disease is on the rise in elementary age school children. Well, genetically modified foods were introduced here in Ernest in 1996, and I think, I know correlation is not causation, but for anybody who cares about their health, I mean, there are, there are, you know, we are not a nation that is healthy. And so, you know, we just want to have, the, the fear is, is that, that we're going to get some unknown, an unanticipated problem that they're not really testing. For. So more long-term consequences, health, long-term health consequences yeah. that are unknown. And then I really need the labeling. I mean, okay. I do not want to eat this stuff. Okay. And, <laughs> yeah, I think a, a few needs for both sides to consider. The first would be full disclosure, not only in what companies perhaps um, could be involved in the science, but also what activist organizations perhaps are involved in, for example, in listing farm subsidies. I think we also need for full disclosure on what subsidies actually are being given because there is no differentiation between uh, conventional agriculture and organic agriculture subsidies. And I think we also need full disclosure on exactly what the science says rather than just believing the hysteria in the media. Um, one of the needs that I have as a mom who makes very active food choices on my child's behalf is for her to understand what valid science is today. And I think we'd be short-sighted if we didn't perhaps talk about scientific education in this country. Thank you. Fantastic point. This is why we do this little segment, because you all do have other thoughts. Um, so, I'm a farmer, and I have uh, some basic needs around the community that Jennifer brought up of just like a stable land base with people working on the land. And that is fading, obviously, over the last decades. You know, there are less and less farmers every year, less and less farms. And I see that primarily as an economic problem. If it were, if farmers could make a living, there would be farmers, they would be on the land. And so I think the biggest fear I have is that corporate control of seed varieties and inputs and taking that out of the hands of the farmers and the communities where those inputs can be generated and where that seed can be also produced is ultimately going to erode the agricultural land base so much that we won't have agriculture. So let me, so let me rephrase. Let me see if I'm phrasing it right. Sorry. Corporate, no, you're good. Corporate control of seed and is, inputs and inputs is reducing farm farmer viability. Okay. And and more small farm, not and corporate farm. Farmers just need a good price for their products too. That goes into the subsidy thing, which I think is much more complex in this discussion because there's a lot of people, I'm, I'm, my neighbors are not receiving subsidies when the corn price is high, when the bean price is high, which they haven't for the past years. People aren't getting direct payments right now. So, I mean, it's hard to say who's getting what subsidies. It's more of a complex issue than this can touch on. Okay. I think we probably have time for two more. Okay, yes. Control of seed and inputs will erode the ag land base, viability of farms, and pricing prices. Yes, I think that's a fact and a fear. Okay. We only have time for one more. Go ahead. I'm a new owner to a farm, and I've been doing a lot of research into what direction I'm going, and I absolutely will not go conventional. My observation is, is that it absolutely destroys the soil. And what I also have learned in my own dealings with cancer myself 
is that healthy animals, plants, and humans do not need antibiotic pesticides or herbicides. The, pes <laughs> the pesticides are, the pests will attack anything that is unhealthy. They actually can sense the unhealthiness of the plant. So they really are performing a function in nature. So if we get the chemistry right through natural means, we won't need pesticides, herbicides, and pharmaceuticals. So I'm hearing a need. Let, let's keep so, going. Uh, help, keep pursuing your need. Well, and, and Because the bottom line is, I'm not doing the farm for uh, making money. I'm doing the farm for health. And what my thoughts are is that the farmers are sold by being told that the inputs are less expensive when they go conventional. I think the bottom line is, I don't think that's true. I think it's because they perceive they have to do pesticides in order to have a marketable product. But I would contend that the soil is already so badly damaged they're having to overcompensate for that. So, so I'm, and there's a reason I'm pursuing this, and we'll get to the reason in a minute. But Let's make sure we have the need. Go ahead, Lynn. So, is this what you said? We have a need to recognize that without GMOs, we can reduce inputs? Yes, which would make it economically viable and more healthy for us, and would also really preserve the heirloom and heritage seeds uh, gene pool that we have now that's actually very good. And I, I'm worried about getting to GMO cross pollination, especially, it wasn't mentioned, but one of the GMO traits is a suicide seed, which actually will not allow its children to produce other plants. And that force, that company is forcing farmers to buy seeds from them each year because they can't actually save their own seeds. And if that crosses into the heirloom and heritage seeds, that's extremely dangerous. So that sounds like a fear of suicide seeds no, suicide. With, with a lack of being able to save seeds. Yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so there's a reason that we pursue the needs not just want to hear your comments, but to drive down and find out exactly what needs you're trying to create, trying to meet. And the reason we pursue this is because normally we don't get down to that, and therefore we're talking over each other. I'm saying this is what it needs to be, and you're saying the opposite needs to be, and we stop hearing each other. Whereas if we pursue what our needs are, now we can talk about, oh, that sounds like a valid need. And now we're going to open up a conversation between these two to talk about both their own needs and the needs that you all represent. Um, have I forgot anything? Are we ready for this? Anything you all would like to say first before diving in? Okay. So now if you two could stand, and I'm going to sit, but let me give you all a little instruction. This is free for all. You get to talk about anything you want to talk about. John's bringing his computers. <laughs> I think he just took notes. Um, you get to say anything you want to say. We will be monitoring um, for the ground rules. Where did my little flag go? So don't be surprised. It's no big deal if we, it's not like a punishment if we throw the flag and say, hold up, let's pause the discussion and think about the ground rule behind what you're saying. And specifically, ground rule three, understand and care about the other side's needs, fears, and proposed solutions. What would thrill my soul is that when you all begin your open discussion, you start by looking to one of their needs that your side normally doesn't cover and talk about them as a valid point. Welcome to the open debate. Go for it. Would you like to go first? I keep coming back to the, you know, ability to choose food, and I do understand all of the concern. Um, you know, I regularly have conversations with my mother who tends to believe everything she reads um, about food and anything. Um, so, you know, I understand all of the needs that a lot of you have, a lot of the fears. Um, I kind of keep going back to, yes, we do need the ability to choose food. We need the ability to have many options out there. I think that's important um, that we have that. Um, but I also think, you know, the farmers need to be able to choose what they grow and what's going to be, you know, not so much environmentally sustainable, which is very important, but economically sustainable for them. And I think it's good that, you know, because we're having this discussion to begin with, that, you know, the rise for organic and, you know, other produ production methods, 
you know, is giving an opportunity for smaller farmers to, you know, to prosper now. Okay, I'm, I am going to jump in for a minute, and ground rule number uh, six is seek truth and workable solutions over political positioning. So, could you two discuss the ability to choose food, to, to choose your own food? Because I think you have a difference as to whether it's available, you, whether it's able, you want to be able to choose food. And I've heard you say that GMO reduces your ability to choose your food. So, why don't you all talk that out in a way that is based in reality? Well, you, um, I believe you said you're for GMO labeling. Yes, so, I'm going to agree with that. Um, could you comment on why pretty much um, most of the large biotech companies from what I've seen are highly opposed to GMO labeling? Because you and I are rare birds, because I'm actually against GMO labeling, but I'm against GMOs. Right. Um, you're not for GMOs. <laughs> so, so it's... You know, you and I don't quite fit, but it seems to me that while you are for GMO labeling and informed consumer choice, the GMO companies in most of their supporting structures are not, in my opinion. Right, and I think it, that goes back to the to the fear. You know, they're afraid that it's going to cause a lot of people to panic. Um, I spent the last 11 days during the state fair selling um, sweet corn, roasted sweet corn, and corn dogs. And we probably sold, you know, 6,000 ears of corn and 4,000 corn dogs. Not one person asked if there could be genetically modified ingredients. The only question that we got, is there chicken and pork in those hot dogs? And I said, well, yes. And off they went. So, um, you know, I don't think that there is a huge awareness of, you know, I've heard, you know, a lot of people say, well, they either have a very strong opinion, a very few amount of people have a very strong opinion. Um, a lot of the population does not have an opinion at all. Um, so I think a lot of the big companies fear that it is going to put a lot of fear in people's minds that really maybe didn't have an opinion to begin with. Um, so I think that is the major reason why they're against the GMO labeling. Um, to clarify or discuss something there, you just said you feel most people don't have, you, you, you said it's a, major, a minority of people who have a strong opinion about GMOs. Um, and I would just differ with you on that. Um, it is true, I think, in Kentucky, there's a minority of people who are concerned about GMOs. I would submit that nationally, um, it's very different, especially in places like California, Oregon, Washington. Um, I'd agree with you there. So, so I do think there, there's a growing percentage of the population that has a real concern about GMOs in their I guess what, um, what my fear, or what I'm seeing is that, you know, a scare attack that makes a really good story in the media. So I'm always, you know, afraid that it's like, oh, there's one more story that doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, what I think is the truth about it that's scaring people. When, when you really delve into the study or whatever they're referring to, it doesn't, you know, it didn't have a whole lot of merit. Like, like the pig study. You know, a lot of people came out and said, you know, a lot of the research was kind of unfounded, that said, it was a study that said pigs that were fed gen genetically modified corn, you know, had some problems. Well, when they actually got into the study, well, that really wasn't it. They kind of took something out of the abstract and they chose very poor quality feed, you know, to feed those pigs. It had nothing to, you know, maybe had nothing to do with the fact that it was genetically modified. It was, you know, more had to do with the quality of the feed. So, you know, all of these headlines are splashing, you know, across our all of our social media and in the airwaves, um, and, and cause us to like, oh, I can't believe I'm never going to eat that again. When you know, I think we really, you know, have to educate, you know, about the science, and um, you know, and if and if at the end of the day you still don't agree with, you know, what I say, you know, playing with nature. Um, then, you know, you have that right to make that choice about what the food that you're eating. I guess in terms of what you said, you have the right to make that choice. Um, there is a hospital in Canada, I believe it was back in 2011, and they took a group of moms who had just had babies and 
it was 93%, I believe, of the mothers tested positive for BT toxin in their blood. And 83% of the babies were born already with basically GMO contamination in them. So I guess how could you address, um, it, it seems to me that GMOs have already taken away those people's choice. They're already contaminated with the byproducts of GMOs, even before they've left their mother's womb. Well, I mean, I, I'll be honest, you know, I don't know what, you know, how much of that BT toxin is in there. I don't know how it got there. If it was, you know, naturally through the environment, through the water, you know, if they consume those, those products. I mean, I do not know that personally. Um, you know, is, does it cause, you know, bad effects? I mean, I'm sure we could all have, you know, trace amounts of, of mercury in our systems. You know, I, I hope not because, you know, that's bad stuff. But, you know, just us living our lives and everything in the environment, you know, we have, you know, things in our systems that, you know, we don't have a whole lot of control over. Um, I'm not saying that that's, you know, that's a good thing or, you know, it, you know, it's not something that, you know, I don't like that we don't have control over that. But, you know, I understand that fear, but I honestly don't know enough about the study, the research, you know, the things behind it to really comment on it. Do you know how I got there? Did you? The scientists feel that it was from the mothers eating GMO foods. And the GMO manufacturers, one of their original assertions to get GMOs approved was that the GMO proteins would be broken down during digestion, whether during digestion of the animals or during human digestion. Is that correct? That those, and the researchers are pointing out that appears to be false. Um, you know, one of my concerns, needs, fears, if you'd like, is the fact that it appears Monsanto has a history of lying about the safety of their products. So glyphosate, for instance, Monsanto claimed was quick to break down in the soil. And France actually sued Monsanto for some ridiculous sum of money when it appeared that this claim was shown to be false. We're told that these proteins break down in the digestive system. And now this hospital is saying, they're not even just not getting broken down, they're even passing through the placental barrier into unborn children. Even though we were told we don't need to worry about this. And so kind of this history of uh, being told something is safe, and then in my opinion finding out that it wasn't safe. These corporations have put their dollar bottom line before actually waiting to see if their claims are truthful. Well, I mean, I understand, you know, having, having that chemical in, in our bodies um, but I guess I worry, um, you know, is just the presence of that causing any actual harm to us? Because I know I could be as much DEET as I use. I know I breathe it in from all the mosquitoes and the ticks at my house. And I worry about what that could be doing to my and my children's health. But, you know, I feel that that's an important part to be, you know, more safe in a certain part of the environment. I had, um, I was diagnosed with Lyme disease this summer. That was not fun. Um, so, you know, we have constant, um, you know, conflicts with nature. You know, we're trying to, you know, who's, who's going to be the one to survive. So, you know, I'm, I'm torn, which, you know, nature isn't always going to win, no matter how much we modify genetics. You know, it seems like it's always going to win. So it's just trying to take the next step and to do something better. Use the technology we have, learn more. Uh-oh, you're going to throw a flag at me. <laughs> no, not you. Actually, John. Um, I want to back up to what you said for a minute ago about Monsanto. And where there are, where there is proven evidence of lies that is consistent then, you pointing that out, is consistent with Ground Rule 6, Seek the Truth and Workable Solutions. And yet I want to point out that you went a step beyond that when you said, and therefore they're putting the bottom line before being truthful. I would, I would propose, I know this is opening a can of worms, I'm sure there's a lot of mistrust of Monsanto in general, and what I want us to do is make sure we are assuming positive intent from all on the other side. Now, again, where you see specific, actual evidence that, that is true, verifiable evidence that both sides would agree is lie, it's consistent with our ground rules to point out those lies, okay? But to leave and then say, and therefore they put the bottom line, before being truthful, I would, I would propose that that's um, 
not a super pleasant day. So we do have a lot of needs in common. Um, organic, sustainable agriculture wants to reduce pesticides. Um, yeah, I think the difference comes in how we look at the evidence in the sense of what do you do with the um, resurgence of all of these glyphosate resistant weeds? What do you do with the testimony of farmers who are going back to 2,4-D and other pesticides? What do you do with Syngenta's financial officer saying the BT trait is failing already in terms of the desire to reduce pesticide usage yet still going down the road of GMO? Because again, you and I would be very much in agreement. Crop rotation, other solutions all need to be on the table together. But, but it seems specifically to me, in my opinion, that the GMO ones are already failing us pretty rapidly and showing that it's a dead end road. Whereas other things, I think you yourself have said hybridization and other agricultural methods show far more promise. Well, I think, you know, um, like I said, I keep coming back to the, it's an option now. And, you know, you are right. Um, there has been in the news that, you know, things are becoming resistant to the pests, and I mean, I think that just that just happens over time, and that's why they make new um, non-GMO hybrids year after year after year because they're just trying to improve on on the hybrid before. Um, you know, I don't see genetically modified as the answer to solve all of our problems, and again, it's just kind of it's an option, and the farmers appreciate the option. You know, they are they're still going in there in their fields and, and clipping out weeds by hand, and it takes a long time. Um, but, you know, I think I've, I've gotten off track here. I've leveled. Adam Barr came up and talked about the, the issue of the price farmers are paid for food and the price of food. So, so Jennifer, maybe um, you might respond to the solution that John suggested about um, you know, leveling that playing field by reducing subsidies on both or equally subsidizing both or whatever it is that levels the playing field. Well, um, you know, I work for the Kentucky Corn Growers Association. The small grain growers were, you know, a lobbying organization, and uh, subsidies are going away, you know, just because of the budget issues. Um, we are um, fine. The direct payments, you know, they can they can go. The farmers don't need them with the current um, prices. The only thing that we ask is um, for good risk management as far as crop insurance goes. Um, you know, agriculture is one of the few industries America has that has a trade surplus. So I think, you know, we need to protect that. Um, other countries want what we are growing. Um, but if so, the sub subsidies are, are going away. And, you know, I'm, we do, and it, I just want to reiterate, as far as, you know, the markets go, the markets are open if a farmer is asked to grow organic corn or organic soybeans or organic common, cotton and they are provided a premium so you know they are going to get a similar return on those acres that they would if they had chosen a different hybrid or genetically modified crop they will do that because it is about economics for them when you know the bottom line you know they want to produce food but they have to be able to sustain their family so John, is what she's suggesting is would that create the playing field that you're looking for? So in terms of subsidization, subsidization um, boy, that's a tongue twister. Um, so direct payments are one form that farmers currently receive, and I think you're correct because our nation is highly indebted. Uh, those are being reduced. I, I still think the crop insurance program 
is a, is a backdoor form of subsidies because it's the government guaranteeing only for particular crops, which are generally corn and soy and a few other grain crops, that the government will bail these people out if something goes wrong. And that encourages those people not to grow other things, which then alters the marketplace and the price of food. It affects the way beef and animals are raised. It affects the price of meat and dairy, etc. Um, so, to my, you know, my view, and you know, the level playing field is is multifaceted. A few years ago, the government introduced a program called the National Animal Identification System (NACE). And so this was a program where if you were a CAFO farmer who had 10,000 chickens in this room, you had one set of very lenient regulations. And if you were a small farmer like myself with 200 chickens that were running around outside, you had to individually RFID every single one of those chickens. Um, and so this level playing field isn't so much just about subsidies, but it's about an entire governmental regulatory approach that's now about to be codified in the Food Safety Modernization Act that is highly tilted in favor of large-scale monoculture, especially GMO monoculture, and is incredibly harmful and burdensome to small farmers. And so, so it's not just about direct payments and crop subsidies, it's about the entire governmental stance favorably to a very small number of farms that happen to be very large and produce the dollar-wise bulk amount of food and that's very disfavorable towards the smaller farmers in my opinion. Well as far as as far as you know the subsidies go and even the crop insurance and what you know crops they protect, they're protecting the crops that are staples and that you know have a market outside of the borders and then, you know and gosh grain grain has been traded for thousands of years. Um, it's, you know, I think crop protection is still very important. Now, it's actually been making the U.S. money because the farmers haven't needed it besides last year. It was very important last year um, with the drought. Uh, in Kentucky, we lost half of our crop. Um, but as far as the, the monoculture, I am not seeing that at all. Actually, I'm seeing more diversification of crops now from our farmers. You know, they, they've got chickens and they're spreading the manure on their fields. They've got hogs, they're doing the same thing. Um, they're using cover crops. Um, you know, the weather's changing, so maybe I need to start growing sorghum now, which is, you know, a little more drought tolerant. Um, you know, they're putting radishes on their field so they don't have to till. Um, you know, there's, I guess, from my perspective, working with these farmers day in and day out, I guess I see that they are doing so much that does not kind of agree with all, a lot of the arguments. Um, they are diversifying. And I hope, my wish is that we are, you know, providing markets for other smaller farmers because I think they're available. I know they're available. And I hope, I hope that happens. I really do. <laughs> um, I'm going to break in for a second because we had said we would break in for both positive and violations and you just said something as a fact, except you prefaced it with from my perspective, which is very much clarifying your opinion from fact, which is exactly what we want. I'm getting points. <laughs> Continue. You all are making our jobs very hard over here. Um, yeah, could somebody throw a chair or something? Um, I can invite my son up, he will oblige me. <laughs> Obviously, I don't think that we should be, you know, we need to start talking elementary school kids about how, you know, genetic manipulation works or, you know, genetics. Um, 
but I guess I recently read, um, it was a blog, so I'm not going to say how much fact, you know, was there a lot of fact in there, I'm not going to say that, but I thought it was a very interesting take. Um, the title of it was A Liberal's Defense of GMOs. Um, you know, someone who said, I don't like Monsanto, you know, I don't like everything they stand for, however, I stand behind the genetic manipulation of what's going on. And he's like, I can stand behind that because of the science, you know, on how this works. Um, you know, we talked about the flavor saver tomato. It is, they weren't taking genes from another organism to put in that tomato, they just reversed a code so they didn't, you know, Rot as soon um, would be the easy way to say it, but it's yes, it's still manipulation. So I guess just I'm not sure how that would look. Um, I just I wish that you know every I wish there wasn't you know this kind of agenda that if information comes from Monsanto or information comes from the Kentucky corn growers that it automatically has this halo of well you're biased. You know, I'm not going to believe what anything you have to say. And we're, we're kind of the same way, you know, on my side of the industry. You know, if something comes from a party that, you know, does not belong to the government agency or the, you know, the corporation that provided that, you know, we're instantly going to say, oh, well, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. So we do need, you know, one of the solutions is, you know, those third-party studies. Um, we need more of those. So people can, you know, have some better understanding and, you know, the studies that we're talking about. And I love what you're talking about, which is perfectly in line with ground rule number two, assume positive motive, positive intent from on the other side. If we really were more transparent and without accus instant accusation of the source, oh, it's Monsanto or oh, it's those you know, hippie wackos that believe in non-GMO. Passionate people. Yes, and if, if we didn't have those labels, if we instead said, hey, let me look into what's real, then that automatically would give us more education. This is good. Well, kind of, kind of playing off of that was something that we talked about earlier, is, um, you know, the GMO keeps touting reduced pesticide use, but if the plant is being engineered to produce its own pesticide, are you kind of like, kidding me? Uh, am I eating, you know, the, am I even eating more than before just because we're not spraying it? And so I think that that gets to the point that Alan is talking about in terms of transparency. And so one of the needs up there is to get people to trust us or to not trust it, to know what they're, what they're doing. So could, could you speak to, to that particular aspect of it? Or are both of you really like your both of your answers? And I would just add that because I have the word transparency written down. I hear that from both of you. The evidence-based data, you know, how do you propose that we get that so it is transparent to the general consumer? Well, as far as, I know we talked about the BT, the toxin, you know, that is engineered into the plant. Um, I thought it was very interesting that that's an approved organic pesticide. I think a lot of a lot of people have this notion that you know organic is no pesticides whatsoever, um, and it, you know it, there it, are approved pesticides, and BT that toxin is one of them that is approved for use. Um, so you know even if it's an organic pesticide, we're reducing you know the use of those things. But as far as transparency goes, you know, I'm not sure what the organization looks like that people would say, oh, I trust them because there's no agenda there. Well, I mean, just defending, going, stepping forward and defending some of the things that you know that, that people are afraid of. And I think uh, anthrax is organic, isn't it? So, you know, just saying that something's organic, it doesn't mean, you know, that it's not going to kill you. And uh, so I'm trying not to take sides here. I really am. And Alan's going to probably never ask me to do this again. But we're talking about transparency, we're talking about solutions, and so sometimes it kind of feels like that, you know, that, that you can, so, so to be more transparent, just, just to try to step into that space. And so I'm, I'm trying to talk about the need and, and get you guys to talk more about transparency, so, okay. Well, and that's where, that's where, like, with the issue of hybridization versus genetic modification, one of the reasons I think most anti-GMO people are so distrustful is because they tend to think that pro-GMO people are playing loose with facts. 
So they'll point out BT toxin is used by organic growers, but they'll neglect to mention that BT sprinkled in the environment has a very short lifespan. It degrades very, very quickly when applied to crops um, as a spray, as a powder, or whatever have you. Whereas the BT toxin in the corn, as the Canada study shows, is systemic. It, it stays until the corn is consumed, and then it even passes through your digestive system, it appears. And so it's one reason we come to such a loggerhead over some of these issues in the studies, because both sides feel um, that each side is not always being the most forthright with how they handle information. Because I completely agree, there's some internet blogs out there that are anti-GMO, and the studies they're citing or the rationale they're using is just plain poor. Um, and it's fear-mongering, which doesn't help the agricultural issues we face. So the second thing I think that Deanna talked about was how do we get to the third-party independent something you can kind of trust the studies. So do you guys have thoughts on that? I think, you know, whatever source it comes from, I'm afraid somebody is going to find a connection to something or someone that, you know, automatically says, well, I'm not, I'm not going to trust that. Well, that university receives public funds or that, you know, university got money from, you know, Pioneer or the Kentucky Corn Growers to conduct that research, so I can't trust that. So I guess I'm not sure how we can ever have, you know, complete trust of, you know, research and studies. Um, I, would, I would love to you know, learn what that is. I really would. If the entire population could understand our ground rules, for instance, assume positive intent and pursue truth. That's ground rule two and ground rule six. So I assume that this study from Iowa is going to be valid, but I'm not going to be naive about that. I'm going to pursue truth about that. I want to see all the details of that study from the University of Iowa, or from Monsanto, or from um, a non-GMO blogger. I want to see more details, assuming positive intent, but also let's all work together to figure out how we're going to feed our world. So John, did you have a response to that? Well, there's a few options. Um, are you familiar with Underwriters Laboratories, UL? They do safety testing. They're a completely, truly independent company that does safety testing for companies for their products. So I think there's solutions out there that involve especially cutting off the financial incentive from the safety testing. Because who does most of the safety testing right now? The FDA has the companies do the safety testing. And then a lot of universities in America who receive funding from the biotech industry do testing. And, and that's one of the reasons there's not a lot of trust. It would be great to look to a true third party independent, one that has people from all sides of the debate overseeing the testing, as like at a place at UL. Another thing I think is really worthwhile is taking more seriously the research and testing being done in other countries, especially the countries that have concerns about GMOs to the point where they've blocked imports, banned imports, or otherwise blocked GMOs as a whole. Um, rather than these countries being seen as backwards or behind the times, I think it would be prudent to take them a little bit more seriously and hear their concerns, why they've taken the positions, rather than having such an American-centric scientific paradigm. I'm wondering if there's an industry we could benchmark in terms of the evidence base in the third party, such as the medical industry. You, know, you mentioned the FDA, but have you given me any thought to that about is there an industry that we could benchmark that would really truly be evidence-based data and third party involved? Well, I'll be honest, you know, the medical, with all the drug testing, the, you know, the SAP of Address, but that scares me. I'll be honest, it does. Um, I think we poison our bodies all the time with just all the pharmaceuticals. That's my opinion. Um, and 
but I guess with even a third party, you know, trying to find that transparency, how long is long enough to, you know, really determine the safety of something? You know, back a few thousand years ago, somebody's like, oh, eat that and see if it's okay. They ate it, they dropped it up, can't eat that. So, you know, they moved on and found something else. You know, so it's, and, you know, some things we don't know, you know, that may have a bad effect for, you know, until we reach the end of our lives. It's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, you know. Um, so I guess I'm, when it comes to this, we see, you know, the benefits and we know what could potentially be the risks. I think we, you know, any third party or even just us as consumers, we have to personally take kind of this risk benefit analysis and then make it make a decision for ourselves. Um, but as far as, you know, that third party, I think that would be the most difficult thing is, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how long testing needs to occur um, to, you know, prove the safety. Because, you know, it could take one study, it could, you know, take 50 years. So do we, do we kind of, you know, stifle technology to do that, which it could prove to be very beneficial in the end. And, and that's just a naughty issue. There's, it's what's called the precautionary principle. And I think for any broad spread technology that could have great harm, the precautionary principle should be adhered to. We should, we should move slowly and cautiously, especially if there's not an overwhelmingly pressing need to go down this road, which anti-GMO people don't feel there's an overwhelming pressing need to move in the direction of GMO agriculture. But we see there's the possibility of great risk, so we would say like the precautionary principle should apply, especially since we can't protect ourselves from GMO contamination in any meaningful way. And okay, we're getting close to ground rule seven here, which is getting down to our core philosophical needs. This, this sounds like a potential difference. Um, what thoughts on the precautionary principle? Well, I think um, what I what came up in my head was when he was just saying this, probably one of the biggest um, differences. And you know, we say this a lot in the ag community, and I know a lot of time a lot of people agree with it. But you know, we have to feed a growing population. You know, there's going to be nine billion people in 2050, and we feel that it's our um, you know our job. It's our we need to be able to do that now and they kind of go back to using all of these new technologies to be able to do that. So, um, you know, that was the first thing that kind of popped in my head. You know, is that really our, what we need to do? We have to feed all of those people and, you know, there are issues there. You know, just because we can grow it doesn't mean it's going to get there. So there's maybe a difference on what the pressing need might be. Well, you would see more of a pressing need than you would just mm -hmm. because of the industry. Well, I'd say another core difference is we would agree the world's population is increasing and we need to feed them, but we would see GMOs as actually hindering them from getting that food and from meeting that need. It would, it would just be a core difference. We see GMOs because. as putting feeding the world at risk, not at actually meeting that need. Because? And it's, because. Um, because it drives up the cost of food, because it makes the food supply less resilient. Um, so she pointed out earlier with India that India grows the second most amount of food in the world, but yet it has, I guess, some of the highest rates of malnutrition in the world. It's, as I pointed out earlier, we already grow twice as many calories as the world needs. It's not an agricultural issue, it's an economic issue, and it's one that I would submit, in my opinion, GMOs aggravate and exacerbate rather than help. So we both want to feed the world. We both, like, I just like starving children in Africa and India just as much as the next person. The question is, which system will actually get them food that they can afford? Well, I guess I'm, um, I'm thinking of, you know, the genetically modified. What if we can produce, you know, a corn plant that can be grown in, you know, the sub-Saharan Africa? You know, the desert, would that not be beneficial to those people in that area if they were able to do that? They're also looking, you know, golden rice is something that's available now, which, you know, they've added um, vitamin A, or 
beta carotene to this rice to meet the nutritional needs of malnourished people. So, you know, there are some benefits, and I guess they're trying to address some of those world, you know, hunger issues with those crops. And, and again, this would be the core difference where I would say we have ways to radically increase the nutritional value of food. We already have those on the table. They're just not being adopted because the current system favors continuing down this road of technological GM-based tinkering with foods rather than moving in the direction of things we know already would work. And you know, like just personally, my opinion, when I hear someone say, well, why don't we go corn in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, like, but why would we want to grow corn in sub-Saharan Africa? Because there's already species of plants and things that could be grown there. That, though, that and, and we wouldn't be making the people dependent on a foreign country and a foreign company for seed. So why would we want to push those people into our agricultural system? Well, and again, we both, we both agree we want the world to be fed, but I want them long-term to be able to feed themselves sustainably, not, not forced to buy Terminator seeds from a multinational corporation. This is, I think, just one of the core differences. We both want to feed the world. I think your system uh, just continues to perpetuate world hunger long-term because of the way it affects food prices and the way it hands over control of food from communities and countries and regions into the hands of multinational corporations rather than actually equipping them to feed themselves. Well, one of the things, I don't know about our time, but one of the things I guess I'm glad to be a part of, it's, it's interesting how, um, you know, different groups think, uh, even within different commodities. I also work for the Kentucky Small Grain Growers Association. Uh, one of the things they have done is they ask the University of Kentucky to develop a seed that the farmers could save. Um, so it's a publicly um, developed hybrid of wheat seed. You know, wheat has not been commercially genetically modified, it's not available, but they wanted to be able to, to give that back to the farmers. We want to provide you a seed that you can save and use on your farm for your benefit. So, you know, I, again, I think it goes back to, you know, working together. We don't have to give, you know, all of our control of our food system to these big corporations. We don't have to do that. I think it's going to, you know, it does it takes many different um, entities, um, public, private, to be able to, to meet the needs of our, you know, of agriculture. So, and, and this is my ignorance talking again, let's talk Sub-Saharan Africa. Are they able to feed themselves nutritionally without GMO? I don't know, I personally do not know. I do know China. I have, you know, with China, they continue to buy our corn. And Japan continues to buy corn because they cannot produce enough of that crop to feed the animals that they are producing. And, and this gets into... Yeah, and this is more of an issue. Yeah, I mean, like, because my point would be, like, why are we feeding some of the, you know, take a cow, it's a ruminant, it's not evolved or designed, depending on your point of view scientifically, to eat grains. So why are we feeding grains to these animals in the first place? Why are we turning corn into ethanol? So, I mean, we could branch off for hours onto some of the related and, and complex issues. And whether... Okay, and thanks to Rudy, we see we have five more minutes, and there, I did want you all to address genetic drift, because I think you had a difference on what, what is factual there. Yeah, she just brought up wheat, and it was in the news recently in Oregon, um, um, I forget which company it was, they had done some field plots of wheat that were genetically modified, and then they were supposedly destroyed, and then genetically contaminated wheat was found in the region. That is correct. So, which is why, like, our, our side's need and concern and fear is that there is no way to stop genetic drift. Well, they actually, they actually studied that quite extensively to find out how that could have happened. 
and it came down to their theory is that it was planted there intentionally um, and not by drift. That was the theory because who, they could not the they could not do the, they couldn't trail it back to how that could have happened based on its location and, and how the other crop was handled. Yes, you should be asking. <laughs> well, well, I could, but then I would violate the yeah, rules. Yeah. <laughs> so. Or, um, you, you know, what do you do with organic farmers I've met who have lost crops certain years because of drift, where they haven't been able to sell into the organic market because even though they personally planted organic corn seed or what have you, when their corn finally was tested by the buyer, it came back with genetic contamination. You know, I don't know, I'll be honest, I don't know enough about, you know, the segregation as far as, you know, them testing the corn. Um, you know, I don't know how closely that is tested to be once, I didn't know if it was tested once it got to the market or if it was just purely, you know, the production method. So I cannot speak to that. It's some of both, but now, you know, like the, the GMO free project, they do testing after growing and at various stages of production. They'll do genetic testing for companies and for farmers. And both companies and farmers are finding it increasingly difficult in certain regions of the country to not have levels of GMO contamination to the point where the USDA keeps batting around permitting GMO contamination in organic because they see it as an inescapable reality. Do they have a level that would be acceptable to you all, or would that be zero? It would be zero, because I mean, again, like they're they're two mutually exclusive systems. So, on principle three, understanding and caring about the other side's needs, fears, and proposed solutions, are there at this point in the discussion uh, common uh, solutions? I know that there's common fears and common needs and everything, but have you guys? been able to kind of pick out some things, one or two things that you might have in common that you can work together. Well, interestingly, she's in favor of labeling. I, I think I would be correct to say, though, that most pro-GMO people are not in favor of labeling. And I am not in favor of labeling, but most anti-GMO people are in favor of labeling. So she would get along with them, and I would get along with the <laughs> biotech people. Um, so one, one cl clarification, are you, okay, so the labeling, is it that you're not opposed to it or you're against it? I'm not opposed to labeling, right. personally, okay. because I feel that I know enough about it that it would not sway my purchasing decisions. Okay. Is it also true that you're both deeply in favor of transparency of all studies? Yes. Yes. What that means, another debate. No. I don't. I don't want to be felt that I'm being lied to. Good. Okay. And so, tell tell me why there's a question as to what that means, John. Oh, just because um, with this, no. yeah, with the studies, you do have these complex assumptions about how science works, what qualifies, how many years are involved. And, and I think it would be very difficult for some people on both sides to come to a middle ground on when they would finally be happy either direction. Um, you know, because for instance... Is As to just what the assumptions are? Well, 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 I think well, just revealing all assumptions would be good science. Good transparency and good science. What do you mean by assumptions? Uh, And it's time anyway, so hey, let's call that a fantastic discussion. And this is my favorite tackle. This is fantastic. Okay, it is now time for you all to say anything you want to say with some conditions. Uh, first of all, we'll try to keep your discussion about three months. You can ask questions of the panelists. You can just rant. However, we ask you to live by the ground rules and we will also bring up the flags where we see you possibly um, go aside from the ground rules. So does anybody want to talk? We've got about 20, 25 minutes. Make your way to the microphone. Feel free. Go ahead. The microphone's right there.
Personally, I'm against labeling because I think it's what some of the larger companies long term really do want. Because again, since genetic contamination is an unavoidable conclusion in my opinion, labeling allows the companies to continue to roll out more and more genetically modified crops, which continues to erode those crops from being non-genetically contaminated over time. So it basically, in my opinion, guarantees an eventually entirely GMO crop landscape. Because it doesn't require safety testing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, it's something that companies could use as a way to avoid some of the more important issues surrounding GMOs. Okay. And Rudy, would you mind for about three minutes or so per person? You had asked, I don't remember your name, but you had asked if there was an article or something that someone could go to for a quick education. And there is a movie called Genetic Roulette. And you can see it at geneticroulettemovie.com. And it's about 90 minutes. It's usually free online or it might cost a, a, like $2.99 to watch it. But it's a great, it's an anti-GMO movie. Um, but it is, um, it has a lot of, shows a lot of studies from um, overseas as John pointed out. Um, you know, it just seems remarkable to me that genetically modified foods can come on the market with, with practically, with zero testing. You know, they discovered BT corn and they put it on the market and they started feeding it to the animals. Um, um, I'm sorry, and I am totally uninformed, but I would just question whether that is true. I'm seeking truth, that's why I'm asking this. I would be shocked if there was no testing done. Was there any testing done before BT corn was put on the market? Uh, six to twelve years is what they... <laughs> I just read online that it was discovered. It was uh, created in 1994 and in 1995 it was allowed on the market. Is that not so? I don't know the specifics of that, but yeah. everything I've read about the testing of these would, you know, I would not believe that that would be true. Yeah, and I'd love to see the testing too and, you know, exactly what was tested. Were humans tested? Was, you know, were rats? What was the, what was the result of the six to, how many years? Six to twelve? Yeah, that's... That's what Monsanto says. That's what Monsanto says. It's great. But I know BT is not, you know, it's not their product, so. Yeah. Well, in, in America, I believe testing on people is banned for, so it, it's part of the reality. We don't treat mm -hmm. people like guinea pigs, mm -hmm. um, which makes the testing issue difficult. So. Right. Right. And again, I'm not saying that there was testing. I have no idea. So you may be totally accurate. Right. It just bring a question in my head. Keep yeah. going, sorry. Um, no, I guess that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to thank you both for the gentleness and the respect you both have shown. Um, it's been a pleasure watching this debate so far. Uh, my question is for Jennifer. With uh, GMOs, I know a lot of people have a lot of fears of emotion tied up in it. Um, and so I was wondering if you could just briefly give an argument for why people should not be afraid of genetically modified organisms for their family and for their own health. I guess there, uh, over the years, you know, there's been a lot of genetic manipulation, um, whether it's selective breeding, um, genetic mutation happens every day and whether we like it or not sometimes it you know it has bad effects but as far as food goes you know they have tested it they are being very very precise in what they are selecting these plants to be able to do um, you know it goes back to the testing I personally if, if a genetically modified crop was not tested significantly I would not want them to just put it on the market so I believe that they have been tested thoroughly, and it, again, it comes back to the fact that, you know, more than three million or three trillion meals have been consumed, and they cannot directly say that there has been any effect of those foods. So I put, I put my faith in that. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, what would you consider um, an adequate amount of testing 
as far as uh, some of the things that have been mentioned about the BT being part of the systemic in the plant and passing through the um, um, through into the baby uh, with amniotic fluid through the sac. Um, so what would you say would be adequate testing given the stipulations on not treating people like guinea pigs? Um, and also with keeping in mind that maybe in 20, 30 years, further research with genetic, with epigenetics and everything that happens with changing the genes and passing it on to our children. Uh, with that being said, what would you imagine would be adequate testing for us to be able to feel like it's safe? Sounds like a good question for both of you. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know, I don't know what that long-term testing would be. Um, I think there's things on the market today that comes from many industries that you know maybe could not have been tested long enough, but you know, you know, if they say they're doing it in six to twelve years, then I think I can put some trust into that. Um, if they're doing, they're growing the crops, um, you know, they're feeding it to the animals um, to see, you know, if there's any effects there. They're feeding it in high dosage, you know, as long as you know they can. They're testing the animals. Um, you know, I I feel comfortable in what they are doing now. I'll be honest. Well, this gets into a worldview issue. I think this is the third time you brought up the 300 billion. Yeah. And, and they would say there's no credible evidence scientifically that this has caused any harm. And there's, we, we tend to almost idolatrize science in America to think it can answer some questions that are really above its pay grade. Um, I, I just, one reason I don't trust the science so much to sort out this issue is because it, it's really beyond our scientific abilities at this point in time. We tend to think of ourselves as being very scientifically advanced when I think the smartest scientists admit we're actually in the infancy of science. As you pointed out, epigenetics has been around for a handful of years. And yet it is a major player in understanding the pathology of diseases and how people respond to environmental toxins. And we just discovered it. And so to, uh, again, it's why I keep going back to the precautionary principle in my thinking. There are some things that just are not worth the risks to take. It's not right to turn the entire world into your global guinea pig needlessly. And we should wait until science is at a place that it can answer these questions with a degree of certainty. Did you get some Go ahead. I was going to follow up, and you know, I cannot, you know, I cannot answer for the entire world population. But I guess from my experience, my personal experience is that I have not tried to avoid them, and call it being very blessed that, you know, me and my family, we don't have any health issues that have arisen because of our diet. So I am very thankful for that. Um, so from my personal experience, I cannot say that there is a direct correlation of GMOs causing any harm. So I kind of have to, to go with that. And interesting. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so what would you do when people like the lady in L who was interviewed, who appears to have traced back, and there's a good number of them you can go and talk with who've traced GMO corn or another GMO product to health issues. When they eat that food, when they're exposed to that food, it does negatively impact their health. And what do you do with the issue? Do you and your kids have allergies? My, my son has um, seasonal allergies to pollen. We have no food allergies. Yeah. Well, and, and so, and again, this gets back to the science part, um, because something like allergies has dozens of different possible causes. Um, how do we know when it could be a GMO food and not be a GMO food? How do we control for the fact we live in such a complex world? It, it's very easy, I think, for the pro-GMO people to say um, that here's the three trillion meals and there's no ill health effects because there's a lot of things on the table you could point to instead as possibilities. So, which is just why I find that statistic not to be very moving or transparent as an assertion. Because I could also say like, you know, it's, I'm trying to think what would be a really good analogy. Like, 
I mean, there's so many ways you could frame that, like, well, three million people have eaten and, you know, everybody's probably eaten H2O, and so therefore this is, you know, it's just like, you could cut that phrase a number of different ways, but it doesn't give the phrase any real argumentative weight when it comes to the safety, I believe. That was funny. I um, um, threw that out there and said, well, what's the source? What's the source of I'm like, I don't know, but 200 different websites say it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, kind of, I'm confused but, about one thing in particular is that I believe that you said that testing can't be done on humans, yet three, three trillion meals have been served to humans. And you're saying that you're comfortable with the testing. I'm, I'm, I just need some clarifications on that. So if, if testing hasn't been allowed to be done on humans, but yet before, before going, going, going to market, what's that? Before going to market, I think is what Jennifer would look at. What they were both saying is that yes, testing was done on animals, not on humans before going to market. Is that accurate? Yes, correct. Yeah, I think human testing of GMOs is not permitted in trials. They use pigs, rats, and other approved animal species. And then since going to market, yes, we've had three trillion meals that have tested. I guess, and you know, you talk about the L study, I guess, you know, with any study, I try, you know, I'm a skeptic, so I'm just like, well, were they just allergic to corn? Which, there are people, there are very few number of people that are allergic to corn, and I feel very sorry for them, because they can't eat anything that's fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, is that an opinion, or is that... <laughs> Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, so I guess you know I would probably be trying to ask them a lot of questions to determine how they de you know determine how it was you know specifically genetically modified corn and it's like corn is mixed with so many other things and processed food which you know I try to avoid as much as we can. Um, I am a proponent of whole foods. I really am. Um, you know, so I would, you know, I would be asking a lot of questions for that study in particular. All right, there's a question. Okay. Actually, some random comments. Full disclosure, I'm Jennifer's husband. I was I'm, just I'm, getting ready to say the same thing. Full disclosure. I'm a scientist and an engineer, and have nothing to do with agriculture, uh, other than I live with Jennifer. But the, um, I guess a couple of things that as, as we were having this discussion, you guys were having this discussion that, that, they, that came up. Um, one of the things on labeling, I just couldn't, I mean, this was like a pet peeve of mine. You know, consumers say, I want to know. Consumers lie to you. I've, I've had the privilege of working with some very large companies in the past, and it's amazing. People say, I want to eat healthy stuff. I want to know these things. They don't. Uh, and if they tell you they do, they're lying to you. Uh, and it's, it's really kind of comical almost to see how that develops. So I can certainly see there's pros and cons of wanting to label them on both sides of this, but I can see the people in marketing these large corporations are like, oh my gosh. Um, but I mean, that's just you know, maybe anecdotal, but I've seen this, and it's, it's hilarious sometimes to watch how people respond. The, uh, the, the transparency thing on the, the research, um, there was a particular organization that was mentioned as, as being maybe the, you know, the, the poster child for transparency. Uh, I have worked with certain organizations that might be in the Chicago area. And I can assure you that while they may be transparent to a degree, and they may not be for profit, they sure are for cash flow. So before you start saying this is my my golden child, you might want to do a little more research and who you're picking as as your as your golden child, because um, they're not quite as maybe as transparent and as 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 wonderful as you think they are. The more you start looking at them. So that being said, you know for this worldwide transparency. This having the ability to go in and have someone say that okay, this is good, and be our data keeper. Maybe Google said, I don't know, but it, I don't think that there's too many folks out there that's going to qualify for that. So that's it's, that's an incredibly difficult issue to to tackle and address. John, I do completely agree with your comment that as scientists, that we are just at the infancy of what we understand, and I think it's very easy for us to sit back and say, oh gosh, we know so much today. But if you look over the history of where we are, um, you know, 30 years ago, electronics were viewed as being the greatest thing since sliced bread. Look how they're saving our planet. Well, now we have Rojas because we found that all these things that we're, we're using in electronic components can be dangerous. We're still fighting on whether this little thing causes brain cancer or not. 
And you know, so there's there's so much to this that's out there that's that's evolving from a science and technology standpoint. And then to go and say that well, we can't pursue this GMO avenue because it might be risky. That's true, it might. But you know, I'm if you start thinking about who we are as Americans, who we are as innovators, I don't think anybody wants to bury their head in the sand and say I don't want to go. And that's not human nature. So even though I understand your concern, and I, I share some of your concerns with myself, I don't think you're going to stop that. And we've just got to try to figure out how to do this responsibly. And, you know, we can't test on humans, but I think we do. I'm sorry, I'm rambling too much. But it's good. anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. I'm just glad he picked on him and not me because he had me in tears on the way here of all the questions <laughs> someone could potentially ask. <laughs> Well, and he does bring up why, at least in America, I don't see GMO labeling as being very helpful. Because Americans don't really respond to labeling. Now, over in Europe, labeling has played a major role, but they're very culturally different than we are. And so what works in one country doesn't necessarily work in another because of cultural differences. Okay. Yes, and so while... Uh, at least for the time being, it may be difficult to ascertain if uh, the genetic modifications to these foods are uh, how bad or good or neutral or whatever, it, how it affects human health in particular. I do, it's my opinion that in the future and probably soon in the future, that we will start to come out with some uh, interesting things, interesting studies about how it perhaps might negatively affect, uh, and this is why I'm up here, the, the main point of this, I haven't heard anybody talk about uh, like the microbial, microbial environment within us. You know, because we, especially on our digestive tract, we basically live in symbiosis with the critters that live there. And so while it may be hard to ascertain if the genetics, uh, genetically modified foods negatively, uh, directly affect our cells, but you have a, a, a totally different type of uh, well genome within you, and those are the mic those are the microbes that live within you, and they they could possibly be influenced by that stuff that, that we eat, and so maybe we should pump the brakes until we figure out more things of that nature. And in my opening, I mentioned Doctor Theory of Rain and. That is one of his major concerns, is the issue of lateral gene transfer. That when you mess with a genomic sequence and it breaks down, you now have genes running around and our, our understanding of bacteria is far enough along, genes love to share bacteria. I mean, genes, so it, it's, it's amazing. This is one reason why bacteria have evolved antibiotic resistance so quickly is they're like the true Wikipedia open source approach to knowledge and, and these gene fragments as a, I had a slide up but I don't know if it got read because I was zooming in China um, altered bacteria with novel gene fragments from genetically modified crops are being found in the soil and in the rivers showing that they're starting to systemically pollute the environment, in my opinion. So I think that's a really valid concern that some of the anti-GMO scientists have raised, that, that this can have unintended consequences, especially at the root level of life, bacteria. Because at the, at the end of the day, we kind of think we're alive, but you're really just a big walking ball of bacteria. So bacteria, well, bacteria outnumber the cells in your body significantly. And when we begin to mess with those bacteria, it can have major consequences that we do not understand. The, the only reason why I understand why I'm so confused is because you talked to me before this event uh, quite a bit. And uh, so can you clarify that the issue with the bacteria has to do with uh, kind of gene splicing from bacteria and proteins and things into the, um, so I could be right. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, I'm gonna just so, really mess it up. Yeah, so to try and really briefly summarize in about 90 seconds. GMOs are based- No more than, yes. 
Uh, GMOs are based on an understanding of genetics developed about 60 to 70 years ago by a gentleman by the name of Wick, I believe. The idea was that a single gene codes a single protein, one-to-one -one relationship in genetic encoding. Human Genome Project, I believe, finished up in 2002. They came up with 25,000 genes, but over 100,000 unique proteins used in the human body, showing there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between genes and protein expression. So what happens is, um, when you begin to mess with this protein encoding based on the genomic sequence, you create proteins that have never been there before. You, you, you just have, it's the rule of unintended consequences. If each gene only could encode one protein, a genetic scientist could say with a fair degree of certainty, this is the only possible effect this genetic modification is going to have. Because it's one gene, one protein, we know how the proteins function. But genetics don't work that way. So Very Thrain is one of a number of major genetic scientists whose concern is rooted in the fact that the, the genetic theory undergirding GMOs is no longer known to be true scientifically. Okay, what we're gonna do is have each person on stage wrap up for one to two minutes. If you have any comments that you would like to make, any of the coaches, we'll end with you two having closing arguments for just one to two minutes. If you have anything else you'd like to say, if not, that's fine too. Um, and I'll close this. I think I am now, yes. I want to say thank you to Alan for the concept and for bringing us all here. So uh, just recognizing that this is a remarkable experience to be a part of. Thank you to both of you for uh, being willing to have a political discourse and tackle an issue and not each other or your coaches. And, <laughs> and, and just recognizing that it is remarkable enough for someone in business to write nine ground rules of cohesive team behavior, but even more remarkable to bring them to political discourse. And so I just invite us to recognize Alan and give him a... So that's the requirement. Everyone has to thank me. So. I'll probably be the first but not the last to just thank you guys for the amount of prep work that you guys put into this. I know that it was a lot. Uh, they both sent uh, quite a bit of information for uh, us to review and videos and things like that. And uh, they're both very dedicated. I think and both want to protect the health of, of uh, people. And uh, so, uh, and, and then the way that you guys conducted this shows that you studied the ground rules. and. You did make our job very hard, so we're, we're almost going to have to do the flip of this and encourage contention at some point. <laughs> but, uh, so let's do gun control again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Were you there for that? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there was an article. Do you want to do raw milk? milk? I have an article. Please don't. If you can get the Kentucky State Health Department. <laughs> but but I, I, I would just like for the audience to know that, that both of these folks put a lot of work into this. tell you that I am uh, most encouraged about this tackle event because you came to the point of um, ground rule two uh, in terms of positive intent for each other. We saw that. Also ground rule six about seeking the truth. Um, there, because you, there were so many things that you had common needs and concerns that I'm encouraged that there is a workable solution. Um, and I know we didn't get to that tonight, but I, I do believe that because of your positive intent for each other, because of your knowledge. Um, it is not just science, it is an art, and the science combined together, and that's what I saw tonight. So thank you. John, closing comments. I just want to thank you all for coming, um, especially my friends from the Buying Club who have, have discussed these matters at length with me. Um, I want to thank Alan. So we had dinner all together, I guess it was about a month ago now, and so 
I, I really encourage, the only reason that I agreed to do this was because the goal is good dialogue and discussion, rather than chair throwing and other things. Because too many Americans waste their time on chair throwing and other things, rather than trying to engage in good discussions about issues. Again, I am extremely um, thankful for the opportunity. Um, I know, you know, again, I don't hold a very popular public view of genetically modified, you know, especially among, among my peers. Um, but I think more information, more of this needs to occur. Um, on a, was it Easter dinner, um, my sister's boyfriend came over, and we just happened to start talking about food, and instantly he's like, yeah, he's like, I don't like that genetically modified stuff. You know that company, Montessori? <laughs> <laughs> and I just shake my head, and I'm just like, oh, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I worry about people just regurgitating things that they may have happened upon as if really understanding, you know, the, you know, the real issues at hand. And I just quickly, I had, I had a very snarky comment in our, um, our last, you know, audience member's question I was thinking, well, Dan and Activity, Dan and must be in cahoots with Monsanto so they can sell more of their Activity yogurt. <laughs> that, was, that was what popped in my head, and that probably doesn't follow the ground rules. That's right, it does not. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, thank you again. Okay, um, before we go, a couple of challenges. Um, I gave a speech last week to the Louisville Tea Party. I think a couple of you all were there. And challenged, uh, basically uh, talked about these ground rules as well. And when we got to ground rule number two, assume positive intent from all on the other side, there was definite resistance. Because of course, Obama is evil. <laughs> Many people say amen. And if I was talking to a left-wing crowd about these ground rules and mentioned George Bush, there would be, not everyone, I'm not saying everyone, but there would be a significant number of people saying, but he's evil. Because we get so entrenched on our side, believing in our worldview and looking at the needs of the people on the other side and saying, there's the only explanation for why they do what they do is because they are evil. And in this conversation, I think it's very tempting to see Monsanto, if you're on the non-GMO side, and say, evil corporation with greed. And if you are on the GMO side, you see Dr. Vern, Vrain, Vrain, and say, whack job, just trying to destroy, destroy corporations. Okay? And it's not true. It's not aligned with truth. And as long as you keep that mentality of the other side being the cause of all your problems, the other side having negative intent, then we will continue to have misinformation, to not have good solutions, and to struggle feeding our world and, do, and, and having fixing gun control and fixing our health care. We cannot solve our difficult problems unless we align our brain with the truth about the people on the other side. And so I beg you, when you go on Facebook, when you have dinner discussions, check your words. Take these ground rules with you and check your words. Check your belief structure about the other side before you engage in that conversation. And align your brain with the truth of these ground rules and then have that conversation. And watch how it changes. Watch how you start hearing the needs, pursuing the needs of the other side and caring about their needs just as much as you care about your own, and life will change. So finally, this is what our business does, Tag Force Solutions. We work, um, we, we do it for fun here for you all in the political context, but for um, business, we do it with executive leadership teams. We have a similar set of ground rules that are outside for business that say, if, if you're having a lot of organizational noise in your company, we can help you fix that by helping you understand what truth is about your employees, about your customers, about um, all the people around you, your family. So we encourage you to live this way. Take it home, take it to heart. And thank you all very much for coming. It's been a blast. <laughs>